Before I begin, let me mention that everything I'll say today will be based on not so recent joint work with uh, David Conlon and Dimitri Zakharov on the Erdos uh, box problem. Uh, although I thought, nevertheless, it would be perhaps a good uh, good topic that, that falls within the theme of, of the workshop. Uh, in a few words, our result is also about an application of tensor ideas to a problem in extremal combinatorics, but perhaps from a different side of extremal combinatorics than the capsid problem and the related problems. And on the other hand, uh, it's a topic that's also very rich in, in open questions. So uh, I'd like to maybe advertise a few of these. So without further ado, let me, let me set, uh, talk a little bit about some background around this problem. So as, as uh, perhaps all of you uh, know already, a, a major theme uh, in extremal combinatorics is determining the maximum number of edges that the graph or a hypergraph can have if you forbid uh, a certain uh, fixed size graph or, or hypergraph. And uh, this, this whole start with this really beautiful theorem of, of, of Turan, first proved by Mantel in, in the particular case when R equals three, which states the following. If I give you your parameter, that's at least three, a positive integer and a graph on N vertices uh, that does not contain a copy of the complete graph on R vertices as a subgraph, that the number of edges of, of the host graph G is maximized by this nice quadratic function in the number of vertices, this n squared over two times this factor that depends on R, uh, one minus one over R minus one. This is a really nice theorem. It's important, uh, not just for historical reasons. Also, I think it's uh, really the um, quintessential perfect theorem in, in, in extremal graph theory. It, it, it answers uh, a question about the maximum number of edges. It gives an upper bound. This, uh, this upper bound is achieved by a certain graph called the Turan graph, which, which I'll uh, insert a couple of pictures of in a moment. And even more than that, we understand the equality is perfectly well. So the only graph that achieves this equality that has this number of vertices with the constraint is really this, this Turan graph. So well, what, what is this graph? So now equals three, and we're looking at graphs that don't contain any triangles. This is the perfectly balanced complete bipartite graph with n over two vertices on the left, n over two on the right has uh, edges n, n squared over four. And uh, in general, uh, this, this kind of idea uh, extends very nicely. So uh, to get a really dense KIC graph, you, you split the vertices in R minus one groups uh, as, as balanced as possible and insert all the edges between vertices in different groups. Okay, so uh, this is the last theorem. Uh, what, what can follow the basic theorem? So uh, many, of course, questions I want to ask. So for instance, if you, if you uh, Look at other graphs instead of a complete graph on our vertices. Pick, pick some other graph, H. What is the maximum number of edges that G can have if it doesn't have a copy of H as a subgraph? Uh, so uh, this, this, uh, this invites some notation. So with, with, uh, with this EX of N comma H, uh, we denote exactly this answer. So this is the extremal, not the extremal function or extremal number of H. Transparent can be uh, very nicely uh, written in, in this equation. So the extremal function of KR is exactly this, this number that was on the right-hand side before. Um, so in general, one, one can derive something of the same quality. Uh, so this was done by Edwards and Stone in 46. So for any, any graph that you fix, the extremal function is, is uh, up to uh, subquadratic error terms equal with this, this function. So n squared divided by two times this one minus one over the chromatic number of h minus one. So another beautiful theorem uh, is the beginning of many, many stories in extremal graph theory. Uh, so uh, um, that, that I won't really touch upon at all. Um, and the, the story for today starts with this observation that for bipartite graphs, if you take H to be a graph with chromatic number equal to two, this fraction uh, is equal to one. And so one over the chromatic number is equal to one cancels with the one there. So this, this expression just says uh, that the extremal the extremal uh, number of ages, little o is n squared, which is just an inequality that's interesting on its own, but uh, it also invites uh, further investigation. It seems like it's different behavior than, than, uh, than what happens for graphs that, uh, that have extremal number quadratic in them. So uh, it's a very natural question, can one do better in the case of bipartite graphs? And this is what uh, uh, is now, now this called the Zarankiewicz problem. Uh, equivalently, if I give you a bipartite force graph, with n vertices on the left and on the right, and doesn't contain a bipartite graph, 
Uh, a complete vertical okay. graph with parameters S and T. So S vertices on the left, P on the right, and all the edges between them there. So you don't have a structure like this. Um, what is the maximum number of edges? Can one do better than little over n squared? The answer is yes. Kovar says to run through this in 54. Uh, they show that the number of edges at most, there is a polynomial saving, it's at most n to the 2 minus 1 over s, or equivalently this, this extremal function of the complete bipartite graph. Uh, with, with two parameters, the same is at all bounded by n to the two minus one over s. And the question really quickly shifted: uh, when, when is this upper bound really achieved? This 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 became what's known as as the Zaran Kebish problem, and uh, it's really beautiful problem. So uh, there's a lot of literature around it, uh, uh, and 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 a few it, it turns out it's it's a it's a much harder problem to to answer because it seems like. Constructions of such extremal graphs, whenever they're available, are not so complicated like in the case of Turan's theorem. So they almost always are witnesses to some kind of uh, basic intersection theory phenomenon in, in, in over finite fields. So uh, this, this was uh, quickly noticed in, in some cases when S and T are small, in particular when S equals T equals 2. Uh, so graphs without complete bipartite with two on the left, two on the right. This is also C4, the cycle of on four vertices. Um, uh, and also brown in the case with S and T equals three. So there are graphs that match this covariance of strong up or down. And the constructions are really nice incidence graphs between points in very simple geometric objects over, over FP squared and FP, FP cubed respectively. This, this kind of philosophy was, was then really pushed uh, as much as possible to, to get constructions for various ranges. Uh, of SNT. So I will only, uh, I will really not, not tell the story properly. I'll only mention really the, sta the state of the art. So uh, we're T sufficiently large in terms of S, specifically at least S minus one factorial plus one. Uh, there exist such extremal graphs that, that match the covariance to strong bound up to constant. So there are graphs of this many edges, into the two minus one over S in that case, that are KST free. And uh, they come from so-called norm graphs over finite fields. This is the uh, work called Ronier and Sabo that was further refined by Alon Ronier and Sabo that introduced a certain tweak to this construction. And then um, Boris Bull, uh, in an attempt initially to uh, come up with a simpler argument that for T sufficiently large in terms of S, we have constructions. Uh, came up with, 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 with a different method to, um, to construct such graphs initially might do, that, that did much worse than, than uh, the, these norm graphs. But then uh, not too long ago, last year, uh, he managed to push, push these new ideas, so-called random algebraic construction uh, approach to, to get, uh, get some new constructions, uh, completely new. So when, when T is uh, already at least this exponential uh, into the S times, times this factor, uh, uh, which, um, but but uh, when when S is small, the, the previous construction are still still uh, the only existing ones. So I won't, I won't say much about the, these uh, these constructions. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, except for I want to maybe give you a short teaser about the construction in the case when S and T equals two. That's not really the original construction at all, but. In some sense, it will bring us closer to, to tensors. Uh, so uh, what's one way to obtain a dense graph with well, a graph with n to the three over two edges that doesn't have C4? Well, one can consider the, the, the usual trace map over this finite field extension. This is the two-dimensional vector space over P. Uh, and so this, this, this is the map that sends each element in FP squared to, to the sum of that element. And it's only non-trivial Galois conjugate, the P power. This element. One well, can take the following graph. So take the vertex set to be FP squared and put an edge between two vertices of FP squared if the trace of the product equals one. So this uh, when this object when regarded as a bilinear map, so the, the map that sends the pair xy to the trace uh, of xy, so it has these nice properties, and we're looking at only the pairs that that uh, for which the map sends the pair to to one. Uh, so it's very easy to it's very easy to see that uh, this has the right number, the right number of uh, edges. Each vertex has the degree of p, uh, and the file doesn't have any C4s. Well, uh, 
it's a bit fun to fun to do. I, I, I did it in one way. There are many, many different things. So if you say, for instance, have a K22 where the left vertices are A1 and A2, and the right vertices are B1 and B2, and you know that the trace equals one for all these cross pairs. Uh, well, what you can do is the following. If all these vertices are distinct, you can write A2 as A1 times one plus X, where X is non-zero. You can write B2 as B1 times one plus Y, where Y is non-zero, okay. Uh, and you consider the following map, which is very nice. Of course, since it's a trace map, it's a linear over FP. So it's a map that sends an element U in FP squared to the trace of this product, A1 times B1 times U, A1 and B1 being the first two. Uh, elements from from these two uh, from from the K to two description. <clears throat> okay, it's very easy to compute some values of this function. So, for instance, when you plug in u equals one, you get trace of a one b one. So, uh, by definition, f one equals one. When you plug in uh, u equals x, well, this trace of a one b one times x. Maybe it's easier to. Uh, it's okay. I won't write. Uh, it's it's a very easy computation to 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 do in your head. If this this trace of a one times b one times x is the difference of two traces, is the the trace of a one times b one times one plus x minus the trace of a one times b one. But trace of a one times b one times one plus x is another one, one of these traces in the list. Uh, it's in particular trace of. Uh, a2 times v1, which is equal to one. So that's one minus one equals zero. Same for, for y, same reason you get that value of f there is equal to zero. A bit more uh, challenging algebraically. You need to do, to do two such substitutions. You get that the value of this function f at x, at x times y is equal to zero. The, this one uses the last, uh, last piece of information that the trace of a2 times b2 equals one. And you plug in what a2 and b2 are in terms of x and y. So you have these four, four, uh, four nice relations. But on the other hand, uh, we're only in fp squared. If I pick three elements in fp squared, we must be linearly dependent. Let's say I pick these ones, one x and x y. Uh, if the linear dependence has the number one with a non-zero coefficient, well, I just apply f this linear dependence, and I get that one must be equal to zero. On the other side, if this linear dependence does not have one with non-zero coefficient, well then x and x y are linearly dependent. I just cancel x because it's non-zero, and I get the contradiction that way. Very very easy, uh, uh, very easy exercise, but it's somewhat fun, and I uh, I think uh, in some sense uh, it motivated everything that that we did really for this problem. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think it's easiest to to describe this as a bipartite graph. I, I x cannot be uh, equal to x y in the setup. So yeah, I didn't really put all the all the details there. Some some kind of argument like this, uh, and it will rule out this x equals y. To I'm not sure was the maybe quickest. Okay, so uh, that, that that's really the argument. Um, so let me tell you now about hypergraphs. So the Zankiewicz problem has a very um, very nice hypergraph variant so to set up some notation. If I give you uh, some numbers, S1 up to SD, and some uniformity D, at least two, I'll denote by this the B part of the uniform hypergraph with SI vertices in group I. And there's also a corresponding extremal function or the extremal number. This will be, uh, we're just going to restrict to B part hypergraph. So this will be the maximum number of hyper edges in. Uh, in a host graph, that's the in a host hypergraph, that's the uniform and the part types of the different sets of vertices. And there's no um, no copy of this uh, this complete uniform um, hypergraph. And all the all the vertices have uh, each size n. So this has a it's kind of an ugly definition to if you, if you haven't really worked with this, but it has a much more appealing maybe the formulation maybe in the world of additive combinatorics. Uh, so this is completely equivalent to asking for the largest subset of the d-dimensional box that does not contain a subbox of of, uh, of that order s1 times s2 times sd. So uh, uh, Erdos studied this question in, uh, in, uh, in a paper 
uh, in the 60s, he generalized this Kovalev-Sostra an upper bound. He derived a general upper bound for all possible uh, S1 up to SD. In fact, you don't really need S1 to be at least two. I think I just restricted to this, uh, this range because that's where the problem is most interesting. But uh, uh, the upper bound is quite general. Uh, any choice of numbers, uh, let's say, ordered in a way, then the, the extremal function is at most. This n to the power d minus the reciprocal of the product of the smallest d minus one of the integers there in the list. <clears throat> so uh, the, the the general question is when when uh, when is this achieved? Uh, when can we have constructions of graphs with this many edges and and without subboxes of parameters s one up to s d? Um, so, so this is a difficult question because, of course, uh, it captures the graph problem, which is already difficult on its own. But uh, there are some, I think, new difficulties that are specific to higher uniformity, which are quite, uh, quite appealing. So, for instance, unlike, unlike the, the graph case, where the, the cases when S and T or S1 and S, S2 small are quite well understood, uh, this is really not the case in higher uniformity. So, for example, uh, if we take all the numbers in the list to be equal to two, this is uh, uh, an open problem. Uh, for us already in uniformity three, uh, this upper bound of Airbrush says that this extremal number of k two to two is at most n to the eleven over four. If you plug plug in the numbers in the in the upper in, in, in the in the first inequality, and the best known construction is. Uh, a construction with n to the eight over three edges. So, uh, yeah, by, uh, I, I should perhaps mention <laughs> uh, that that uh, in this in this case, this this uh, this k two to two uh, graph or hypergraph in, in uniformity three is also known uh, as the the octahedron graph. If you regard the, the edges of this graph as as uh, simplices in R three. This is really this picture. If you want, if you prefer to think about it as as a three part graph, think of the corners of this octahedron being the the vertices that form the three groups. Uh, and uh, oh, octa, oh, octahedral graphs and the the, the d dimensional generalization, to be precise, are uh, pop up in several places. So, for example, they're also important in the theory of quasi randomness. So, the same way the graph is quasi random. Uh, if it has the fewest number, fewest number possible of C4s given its density, uh, so are hypergraphs quasi random if they have the smallest number of, uh, of uh, the dimensional octahedron like K2222 uh, given their density. Um, so the lower bound I, I, uh, I should mention is due to Katz, Krupp, and Majoni from 2002. Uh, and, and finding the answer just in this very case, uh, I think is the most tantalizing case, known as the Erdos box problem. Uh, okay, um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what's known in higher uniformity. So uh, there's a very simple probabilistic argument that one can do, but it's really standard for a lot of questions of this nature, but regardless of what the hypergraph you're forbidding is. So uh, essentially, if you if you take uh, a random the uniform hypergraph on n vertices, or if you want to just Focus on d partite ones. Take uh, d groups of n vertices and take uh, uh, each edge possible present there with a fixed probability p. One can compute uh, very easily what's the expected number of edges in such a thing, right? It's p times the total number possible of edges n to the d. It's also very easy to count what's the expected number of k to the twos uh, in such a thing. <clears throat> Uh, and then what you do, okay, well, we have this, this uh, random uh, version of GNP in, 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 in the uniformity. And uh, uh, why wouldn't I have uh, on average key to the twos? Well, you can remove from, from, from a possible output one, one, uh, one edge from each key to the two. And, uh, and uh, show that on average, if you pick P to satisfy the correct, uh, correct approximate equality, then you get a fairly large very large output uh, that uh, that does not have any copies. So just destroying manually from a random from, from a random object, destroying manually the copies of k to the two. Uh, and uh, if you if if you do this correctly, uh, the, the the edge density that one gets the p uh, is is this n to the minus d divided by to the d minus one. 
Okay, so this, this is very simple, uh, and uh, the, the result I mentioned earlier for D equals three improves it, but uh, in higher uniformity, uh, it's uh, somewhat of a stubborn, stubborn uh, lower bound. So uh, it took a while to, to do better than this, but it has been done, partially so, in, in, uh, by Gundes and Robel and Sidorenko in 99. Another, I think, very beautiful paper and for the history of uh, extremal combinatorics, because in some sense it introduced most of the ideas behind the random algebraic method that also book used and so on and other others and all sorts of directions so what what they showed is that well okay for some uniformities d if i have a number s that's the smallest integer such that this fraction s d minus one divided by two the d minus one is an integer then it turns out you can go a little bit on the exponent so this is a polynomial gain there's a there's a factor there of one over s with a minus uh in the exponent uh so as as hinted this this uh, this is an improvement but not in all uniformities so uh it's, it's not uh not not uh, not too hard to see that uh, this this uh this s exists precisely when d and to the d minus one are relatively prime uh integers which which happens for uh for for, for infinitely many uniformities like when d is a prime power or uh or a Okay, odd prime power or power of two, any any prime power, but uh, it fails for quite a few numbers. So if it fails, for instance, for a number k, it fails for all the multiples. It fails for six, twelve, eighteen, but it fails for other ones too. It fails for twenty, twenty-one, and so on. So positive density of numbers fails to have this. So uh, for those, uh, it was for uh, uh, the, the the probabilistic deletion argument was was still uh, still the best. So uh, this is where we came in. We are really intrigued by this because, uh, especially because of this funny condition. So in in, uh, in 2020, so three years or so ago, with, with David and, and Dimitri, we improved on this bond uh, uh, of Gunderson, Rodel, and Sidorenko uh, by really toning them out, which might be uh, almost imperceptible if you if you're just staring at these exponents and you're seeing them for the first time, uh, just to compare it with the probabilistic lower bound so over there there's this fraction d minus d divided by two to the d minus one there all we have here is that we have a ceiling function somewhere so it's one uh, it's really the same fraction except now we have a ceiling function which is a gain over the probabilistic deletion bound in all uniform it's just because the fraction is never an integer or the reciprocal of an integer <laughs> forget which way uh, so d never divides to the d minus one this this is an elementary number theory exercise. Uh, it's also not clear that uh, you know if if you don't stare down at, at this long enough and, or write some things, it's not clear uh, that it improves on the gunderson rodel sidorenko bond, but it does. Uh, it does for uh, every uniformity where that method works, except for powers of two, where it's actually identical. That's a curious phenomenon we don't, where we don't really uh, know what's going on. Also. Uh, when d equals three, this matches this n to the eight over three uh, bound that I mentioned earlier of Katz, Cope, and Magioni. Um So yeah, let me see how the time is. Oh, my goal today will be to try to tell you uh, uh, about this proof, since I think uh, it's not not a difficult one. I think it's a appealing use of tensors. But before that, may may you mention a acute consequence that could maybe serve as. Uh, Motivation for to look for other such improvements for extremal numbers whenever possible. So uh, there's not just this small gain over over the probabilistic deletion bound, this small polynomial gain in the exponent uh, is already enough to establish uh, uh, an optimal counting result. So uh, a quick corollary, and really we don't really do any new work here. A uh, quick corollary of our of our theorem is that for any d, at least two, in any uniformity, the total number of uh, hypergraphs on the vertex set from one up to n, so labeled hypergraphs, without d dimensional octahedra, uh, is really at most this uh, exponential function to the extremal number of the d dimensional octahedron up to uh, so times a constant that's probably not really optimal. So this is. This is an optimal result because uh, uh, indeed there it's not difficult to see that there are at least that many uh, the uniform hypergraphs without k to the twos. Just pick uh, 
an extremal example, and then any subhypergraph of that uh, will constitute a hypergraph on those n vertices without k to twos, and there are really two to the, that many edges of, of hypergraphs with that property. Uh, so uh, this, this generalizes the classical theorem of uh, Kleiman and Winston, who proved this when d equals two. So in particular, they proved that the number of C4 free graphs on n vertices is most to the extremal number of C4, two to the n to the three over two. Uh, so uh, this part is from recent work of Ferber, McKinley, and Samatish on uh, the so-called hypergraph container method. Uh, and uh, so there is a lot of input really in, in, in what makes this, this, this implication work. We don't really do anything. But, uh, it's somewhat in a small unit well, that uh, just a tiny bound over, over the standard deletion bound, that's probably not an optimal bound for the extremal uh, function. We don't really think that that might be an optimal construction, just a tiny polynomial gain there. It's an optimal counting result. <clears throat> um, before I, I go to the proof and to the promised answers, uh, I'll also add a couple of words about the regime where SD is much larger than S1, S2, SD minus one, because as already discussed in the case of graphs, that's uh, also quite interesting. And, uh, and uh, extending these, these ideas there for hypergraphs uh, took, uh, was quite challenging. Uh, the situation changed in 2018. So in a, in a nice paper, Ma, Yuan, and Zhang uh, proved that it is possible to, um, to find the matching construction for the Zhang-Kevich problem in uniformity D when the last parameter is much larger than S1, S2, SD minus one. The method, uh, was the same as uh, the method originally introduced, originally developed by, by Book to come up with, uh, with an alternative proof in the graph case. It was really bad quantitatively, and, uh, and the bound uh, of Ma, Yan, and Zhang uh, is also quite bad. So already in the case of graphs, this, this gave power type bounds for C, uh, and uh, there's an extra iteration for hypergraphs, so this gets really worse and worse. Uh, for high uniformity, given that the the the, the method uh, of book got very seriously refined for that, it is not uh, impossible that uh, maybe this would be refined also at some point soon. But uh, it it is uh, difficult to not get power type bounds even even with these uh, uh, extra ideas. So one one has to come up with some new ideas to kind of circumvent if there are possible iterations with the uniformity and so on. So that, that typically is not easy to do. Uh, somewhere between between Book's new paper and, and this paper, we also took a look at this and uh, improved the situation uh, by finding the right generalization of the norm hypergraph, rejected norm hypergraph story of uh, Kola, Ronyai, Sabo, and then later Alon. We showed that this, this uh, these uh, extremal graphs for the uniform the problem exists as soon as SD, the last parameter is at least this function uh, of the previous D minus one ones. So it's at least this uh, D minus one times the product minus one, the factorial, not the smallest number in the world, but uh, it generalizes very nicely the, the D equals two case, uh, and it doesn't grow that scarily compared to uh, what one gets by iterating uh, things in this construction. For graphs, okay. but I won't tell you anything about this. It's somewhat orthogonal; doesn't uh, doesn't really use tensors. I will uh, now maybe move on to say something about the case when s one equals s two equals s d equals two. Uh, so maybe it's a good time to pause. If there are any questions about the statements uh, and so on, yes. Uh, so this, this is an excellent question. Probably absolutely impossible. Uh, just even. Uh, even the friendliest case possible for graphs, like this one, for graphs when S and T equals two, where we have these nice constructions, their incidence graphs between points and lines and FP squared, we have this trace construction. Uh, um, the situation does not really match the quality of this original Turantium at all. It would be, it would be indeed great if one could maybe prove that somehow all these examples are unique in an appropriate sense. But this seems very, very difficult to establish, even in this case, and especially more so, I think, uh, in general. Okay, sorry for uh, going back. 
Okay, so let me tell you what idea is. Uh, so I'll begin with, with the Gunderson Rodolfo Sigorenko idea since we really built on this and it's a very neat one. So they also uh, consider a random graph on, on uh, n vertices, or rather, uh, since I'm sticking with the bipartite, the, the bipartite setting, I should probably stop saying n vertices. So the new groups of n vertices. But now we introduce a little bit of structure in this, this uh, random random process that I described, where you remove one edge per k to two, two and, and study on average how many edges you have left. So they consider n to be q to the s, where q is a, is a prime number or a prime power, it does not really matter. Uh, the first d minus one groups are just groups without any structure. They're just uh, d minus one groups of size q to the s. But the last one has some structure. It will be the s-dimensional vector space over f q. Okay. Now, what is the what is the construction? What is the what is the hypergraph that they consider? So, for every d minus one tuple uh, of vertices, where I select one from d one, one from d two, one from d i, one from d d minus one. So for each such tuple, I will associate the hyperplane at random in FQ to DS in the last block. And I will declare edges to be all the D tuples of this form that start with, uh, so for, for this choice of V1 up to V D minus one, I'm gonna consider all the edges, uh, uh, all the D tuples that start with the, these and have V in this hyperplane as, as edges. And I do this for every possible D minus one tuple, where V1 up to V D minus one are in these first groups. So this is a random hypergraph. Uh, and one can study statistics about it very easily. One can compute the expected number of edges in this, in this operation. You can compute the expected number of copies of K222. Uh, it is actually quite important uh, to notice that for whatever the edge density, uh, you get when you compute the expected number of edges uh, in, in this graph, the uh, expected number of k to the twos will be the same size, the, it will be the same as the expected number of densities in a completely random the uniform hypergraph with the same with the same edge density. So it, it will have the same statistics for an appropriate choice of the probability of, a, of an edge uh, existing in, a, in an arbitrary GNP in the uniformity. But now uh, there, there's something new. Whenever we have a copy of k to the two in here, in, in, in this hypergraph, um, well, what does it look like? So we have d minus one vertices, one in each group, one, one in each of the d minus one first groups. But now up there in the last group, we have two to the d um, minus, so sorry, I meant we have two vertices per group in the first d minus one groups. So it's a copy of k two two two. We have two vertices in each. But now here, the two vertices must be common to a collection of two of the d minus one hyperplanes. So I have a bunch of hyperplanes in the last group, which intersect non-trivially. So they meet in two points, but that means, well, they must, the line passing through those two points must be fully contained in all of them. There's no way they can meet in two points without that to happen. Okay, so this, this is just something. It suggests that maybe it's possible to delete k 2 2 twos a bit more efficiently than before. You don't, we don't have to uh, remove one edge naively from each, each k 2 2 uh, If we, for instance, remove, if we, if we focus on a d minus one tuple coming from the first d minus one groups, and we delete all the edges in my graph that involve this d minus one tuple in the first coordinates and all, uh, uh, all the possible points in that common line in the last coordinate, then by doing that operation, I delete by a factor of Q uh, less edges. Sorry, I delete as many, I, I delete uh, by a factor of Q less edges than there are K2 to two tools involving this D minus one tuple here. So here are the Q square choices of points on the sixth line. But if I delete all the edges involving one point on that line and this uh, a d minus one tuple in here, I, I really delete all the k to the twos are, that are there with, with two vertices on that line. So that does uh, uh, allow us to delete uh, 
Tito two is more efficient. There's some bunching happening in this in this last blob of the K to the two. So Q deletions remove Q squared. Yeah. Exactly. Q deletions remove Q squared edges. Right. So this is very neat. It doesn't really work so, so cleanly. I should have said this is just meant to be some kind of impressionistic description of, of, the, of the proof again. Uh, so for example, for many uniformities, one doesn't have to contain, uh, you, you cannot really take hyperplanes. I mean, to begin with, for certain uniformities, this idea doesn't all work to begin with, as we saw from the statement. But then for some uniformities that work, you cannot really gain uh, by uh, picking random hyperplanes. You have to fix another parameter and you'll pick random affine subspaces of that co-dimension. And there's this gain between these parameters. You want always uh, to remove fewer number of edges, uh, to, to remove ed you know fewer than a constant proportion of the number of edges in order to still have edges left. You want uh, to win over the standard deletion boundary. There are some inequalities there that need to be satisfied. And the fact that all these parameters are integers, the dimension and so on, there's some creates some tension actually between between them. Sometimes the, the, the inequalities you get are not really satisfied, satisfiable. Um, but anyway, I think you, you get the, the big picture. What's our idea? Our idea is uh, very, very simple. Uh, so we uh, essentially take the same construction as, as the slide suggests. Uh, for each uh, choice of V1 and V1, V2 and V2, Vd minus 1, the last, uh, in, in the next to last blob, we're still going to define a random hyperplane, except now. Uh, we insert structure not just on the last set, but in all of them. So uh, uh, it would be nice in, if when we x-ray uh, K2 to 2, we don't just see this, this uh, funny bone here, uh, but uh, we see the full skeleton. So we see a bone in here, a bone in here, a bone in here, a bone in here, where that means, well, uh, it's not just gonna be that, uh, for every two vertices on this line, uh, you're going to get the K2 to 2 with those vertices and the 2D minus 1. So if I fix a copy of K2 to 2 and I have the 2D minus 2 vertices in here, it won't just be that pick, if I pick any two points on this line, I get the K2 to 2 with this 2D minus 2 tuple. But this, this, this property is uh, symmetric with respect to all the blobs. So every two points I pick here, there will be a copy of K222 with those two points and the, the other 2D minus two points. So the K222 is bunch up in all the blobs, meaning that for every fix, uh, uh, meaning that I can delete, for example, much more efficiently K222s if I just throw away all the D tuples that I can obtain by picking one point on this line, 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 one point on this line. So I have a K2. I have a line for each pair of points. Then I delete all the edges where I pick uh, one vertex on each line. This process will delete automatically uh, by a factor of Q to the Q to the D, uh, K to the two is as uh, Q to the D more K to two than edges that I actually delete. So gaining a factor of Q from, from each blob. Um, I feel like I didn't do a good job explaining it. So please uh, uh, pause. Uh, I'm happy to pause if there are any questions about this. I think it's a very, uh, very simple idea. So uh, uh, if, uh, if it's not clear, it's my fault. You didn't say how, how, you, how you get a definition like this. Yes, yes. So that, that is really the, the hardest part. I think executing really this, uh, this, uh, this idea. We want to define random hyperplanes to have this behavior everywhere. So the, the structure we need is, uh, uh, we need random multilinear maps. So thankfully, these were uh, already introduced earlier today. <laughs> and and uh, that's I won't really say, say much, uh, much more, but here, just to take notation, uh, the way I'll use it, if I have, uh, so for, let, let's start with uh, a list of d-dimensional, a, a, a list of finite dimensional vector spaces over FQ, they're not dimensional, just they're just B of them. Uh, then I can uh, think of the space of all multilinear functions from, from this Cartesian product to FQ uh, as, as the, the, the tensor product of the corresponding dual spaces. 
And uh, for me, I'm going to form a random multilinear function on, on this Cartesian product of V1 up to Vd will be really an element of this tensor product sample according to the uniform distribution. <clears throat> if we have a list of subspaces, one for each of the Vi's, so if for each, e, if for each, for each I we have a subspace Ui inside Vi, then uh, there's a very natural restriction map from, from the first uh, tensor product to the tensor product of the dual spaces of the Ui's. And this restriction map is very nicely behaved with respect to taking uniform tensors. So uh, uniformly random tensors. So for instance, this restriction of a uniformly random multilinear map to the, to the smaller Cartesian product, U1 times U2 times Ud, is also gonna be uniformly random. Very simple property, but quite important for, for uh, so uh, what, is, what is the construction? <clears throat> uh, I'll state this in, uh, and uh, full generality, uh, even though uh, maybe I don't necessarily have to, but I think uh, uh, it will be a bit more transparent uh, this way. So I fix some parameters, the R, S, and Q, some prime power. You can think of it as some prime number. They will satisfy some inequality, uh, but don't worry about that. Um, and, and I think V to be this S dimensional vector space over uh, FQ. So, this is this structure set from Gunderson, Rodolfo, Sidorenko. But uh, now all the blobs will be FQ to the S. And now I define R uh, uniformly random uh, multilinear maps in this default tensor product. Um, what would be my hypergraph? So, I'm going to consider V part of the uniform hypergraph. Where the vertices, the, the D blobs of vertices are these copies of FQ to the S. And I'm going to say that a, a D tuple V1 up to VD is an edge if this D tuple gets sent to one by all these tensors that I sampled. So this is a hypergraph. The claim is that uh, if R and S are chosen such that some inequality is satisfied, then you'll see in a second where this comes from. Then on average, we can delete. Uh, a small number of edges uh, from H and destroy all the copies of K222, thus remaining with, with, uh, with the construction of a graph, a hypergraph without copies of K222, and hopefully uh, many edges if the number of edges. Uh, so, uh, in particular, if I can convince you uh, that on average the expected number of edges that uh, this departed uniform hypergraph will have is. A constant times q to the power d times s minus r, then this will be a construction on well uh, d times q to the s many vertices. So if you denote this this product by n, this uh, q to the d s minus r will be n to the d minus r over s. So it will have n vertices and this many edges, and r and s satisfy this inequality in d. Um, so, uh, turns out, well, you can choose, for instance, i equals one and s equals the ceiling function, thus giving the result. So, this, this will be exactly this reciprocal of the ceiling function from before. <clears throat> uh, so, you shouldn't worry too much about what those numbers uh, I'll, 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 um, I'd like to focus on, on uh, what's really the way to formalize this, this uh, effective deletion procedure that I was describing. <clears throat> so uh, here's again the construction. Uh, there are three statistics I care about. Let me begin with the simplest one. So if I define this, this departed uniform hypergraph, I claim that on average, it will have this, this, uh, this number of uh, edges, q to the d times s minus r. More precisely, you can write a formula. So there's this q to the s minus one raised all to the power d. First times q the minus r. Well, the first first power. This is the number of total number of eligible tuples that can be uh, that, that can be edges in my in my hypergraph to begin. And notice that if I have some some coordinate z i equal to zero, then it's impossible for um, for my uh, multilinear maps to send that tuple to one. So the eligible tuples are only tuples with non-zero coordinates. And this is how many vectors with non-zero coordinates are there in, uh, 
um, fq to the s times fq to the s d times. <clears throat> okay. And then what is this cube the minus r? Well, this is the probability that we're going to fix v tuple v1 up to vd. Uh, it gets sent to one by by um, by r random tensors in my in my uh, default uh, default uh, tensor product of dual spaces. And this is uh, very easy to see. Uh, here's a quick quick sketch for for this claim. If I uh, if for instance, uh, what's really the idea? So if, if I have, for instance, a d-tuple, v1 up to vd, that uh, let's focus on just one tensor. So if I have a d-tuple, v1 up to vd, that gets sent to one by some tensor t. Well, notice that this completely determines this tensor t on a restriction. So if I take the one dimensional spaces ui generated by these vectors vi, uh, then this uh, this uh, if 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 uh, if t sub i the, the the i tensor is equal to one on v one up to v d then we know completely what is this restriction uh, t sub i prime on on uh, on u one times u two times u d right because uh, we can just calculate it okay so since uh, since this restriction behaves so nicely with respect to taking uh, Uniform uh, tensors at random. Uh, uh, it's very easy to see that if I fix, uh, if I have a fixed tuple, you want up to be d. Well, this the space, the space you want you want star tensor u to star tensor u d star is one dimensional. Uh, so uh, if I sample, you know, the probability that that uh, that the, that the tensor sample there. So this being a restriction of a, of a tensor tensor sample up there. Uh, the, the probability that tensor sends the tuple v1 up to v to one happens with probability one over one over q, right? That, that many um, linearly independent <coughs> tensors. Uh, okay, and since the tensors are in, independent, the, that explains the q the minus r. So this gets ranged to the power r one for each one for each tensor there. So this this explains the statistics for the number of edges. Uh, there's a similar statistics for the number of k to the twos. Uh, I won't go over the calculation, but somewhat similar. Here, of course, this is uh, the number of eligible 2D tuples that can possibly be k to the twos. Again, from a similar kind of analysis, this is how many D tuples are there with non zero elements. And now, if I want a k to the twos, so all the edges in that k to the two satisfying this equality, I cannot have whatever else I pick from the same blob, I cannot have it to be a scalar multiple of, of the first choice. Uh, so uh, this is how many 2D tuples I can pick of vertices, two per blob, where the first one is non-zero for each blob, and the second one is just not linearly, not, not, the, not, the, not the scalar multiple of the first choice. And this, this is the probability that given a fixed 2D tuple, the probability that uh, it it, uh, it forms a copy of k two to two, um, and notice that this these statistics also behave uh, as I was describing uh, the statistics, the behavior of the statistics in the Gunderson Robert Sidorenko example. Uh, if I focus on the edge density here, which is this. Uh, um, which is this uh, q to the minus r? So this is the probability that that uh, that the d tuple is an edge. <clears throat> then uh, this expected number of copies of k two to two is really the same as the expected number of copies of k two to two in a random the uniform hypergraph with this many vertices uh, and edge density. Uh, this q the minus r. So ignoring the structure, just focusing on the st pure statistics. So it, as far as this goes, this behaves exactly like the um, the GMP uh, random graph. So if you go ahead and just delete one uh, one edge per k two to two naively without focusing on the structure at all, we're just going to get the same bound as in the standard deletion bound. That's that's what this this comment is meant to emphasize. Uh, but we have this this branching phenomenon now in each blob. 
So if I denote, for instance, by B, the family of all leap apples that are involved in some K222, the claim is that on average, this number is much smaller than the number of K222s in total. So there is the saving of Q the minus D there. The expected size of B is, uh, is at most the expected number of copies of K22 divided by Q the D. So in particular, if I, there's, if I delete all the elements of B, by definition of B, I delete all K22s, but uh, notice that uh, I'll do more efficient operations. Um, I'll delete all the K to do's, but not paying the price of one H per K to do two. So uh, this is if 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 uh, if you believe in these three estimates, uh, it's not not difficult to see uh, that well if B S and R satisfy some inequality, which happens to be the inequality from before, uh, then this expected size of uh, of B. Uh, is little o of the expected number of edges. So if you really delete all the deep apples from B, you destroy the k to the tools, and you don't really destroy more than uh, a certain proportion of the number of edges. So you're still left with many edges, uh, this many for the choice of S and R that satisfy the inequality. And that was the claim. <clears throat> so in the remaining time, uh, I'd like to tell you uh, how this is proven. It's very simple. Uh, hopefully, I'm kind of secretly hoping that maybe the uh, this this stuff maybe has more applications. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, what what is what is the idea behind this this uh, third estimate? So, I'm gonna uh, kind of classify the K two to tools based on what are the affine lines they come from. So, remember the picture. Every time I have a K to the two, I can draw the line to each pair of points that are in the same blob. And that gives you a set of the affine lines. And by P of N1 LD, uh, I'm going to define the, all, no, this, the, the set of all uh, 2D tuples of vertices where I take two points per line. Okay? And when I say take two points per line, I'm not allowing those points to point inside. So I take two points per line, and xj and xj prime are distinct when you choose them from the line lj. Okay. Very simple calculation. How many, how many such um, such sequences do you have? Right? You have q times q minus one options to choose xj and xj minus, xj prime for each line lj. Uh, so I want to group the k to twos based on 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 uh, these apples of affine lines that, that they can possibly generate. This, this will be a really a double counting argument. So each, each, each K to the two is trivially contained in, in, in a P of L1, LD for some choice of lines, just by definition. These will be the lines determined by the two points from each blob of the K to the two. And here's another trivial property that give you two different sequences of lines. And these, these uh, collections of sequences will be disjoint for if, if, the, if the sequences of lines are disjoint. But the third property, which is the interesting one, is that um, we also have the following feature. As soon as you give me a collection of B lines, the affine lines that C some K222, so there is some K222 on the lines L1, LD. So by F, I will denote the, uh, the set of all K222s in my construction. So the, the, there are two deep patterns where I have uh, two distinct uh, points per blob, and the, my tensors send all those edges, um, send all those deep apples to one so for every choice of epsilon in zero one. If I see some K to the two on, uh, uh, on some lines L1 up to LD, then uh, all, um, all, all, my, all possible choices. Of, of two deep apples where I take two points per line will uh, will form a K222. This is what this inclusion is saying. And this is what I was trying to describe uh, on the picture without really the right words for it earlier. Just to have a, an excuse for my bad explanation. Uh, <laughs> so this was immediately from multilinearity. Uh, so from, from the multilinearity of uh, uh, of these functions, the way we define the edges. 
right? If, if uh, let's focus just on one one of the, the tensors, if, if this P is multilinear um, and uh, we have a K2 to 2 formed by the uh, by, by these vectors, uh, so VI0, VI1, where these are the two from the, the, the set VI, and I do this for I from 1 up to D. So all the possible uh, transversals are uh, of, uh, of so one one tuple per group, uh, one one vertex per group. Well, all those transversals are sent to one via my ten thirty. Well, then okay, if I pick if I draw the line into each pair, draw the line through these two, any vertex I pick on that line will have this this representation. It's an affine combination of vi zero and vi one. And of course, if I plug in. Uh, a d tuple of vectors, each of which is a affine combination of the corresponding two on the line determined uh, by the pairs from the from the k two to two you start with. Uh, then this tensor will send u one u d to one, just because you can insert this. You, you plug in this, and uh, this is really equal to one. So you have these three properties. Uh, for the, the, these uh, tensors of lines, I, I call them, but they're really, you know, collections of 2D tuples of vectors, uh, a sequence for each, uh, I mean, for, for each choice of the affine lines, we have uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, Q times Q minus one sequences, and, and uh, in total, this is the cardinality of P of L1, L2, LD. We have these three properties. So I reach out which K2 is uh, such a sequence, the vertices from such a sequence. The sequences are disjoint for each choice of affine lines. And if I see a K2 to 2 on some choice of the affine lines, then all the possible to these sequences from that um, from a K2 to 2. So this can be uh, very nicely uh, uh, interpreted as follows. If I denote by L all my lines, that C some K2 to 2, then I understand very well the cardinality of L. Right? So I basically grouped the, the K2 to 2s uh, in these different categories, depending on what, what are the lines they come from. So L times the cardinality of uh, the set uh, is equal to the total number of K2 to 2s that you can see. Just uh, if you want, there's, it's a partition of the K2 to 2s into. into um, uh, this many equivalence classes, and each equivalence class has this, um, this cardinality. And then on the other hand, if I give you some D tuple, remember that's involved in some K222, so that's how I define B. I look at all the D tuples that are involved in some K222 to begin with. Well, by definition, uh, this must be a D tuple that comes from uh, D lines, lines that see some K222. So the by union bound is B is at most. Q the D times L. Q the D is the cardinality of Cartesian product of D lines. So uh, putting these together gives you uh, this estimate for B. Uh, so on average, B is at most uh, uh, this, uh, this expected number of uh, K to the twos divided by Q the D, which is really the, the claim. And this is the full proof. So I'm out of time. I just want to end with, uh, with uh, I think, the most tantalizing uh, open problem, for me at least, uh, I mean, maybe second, depending on the mode. Or first, can one do better uh, for, for the box problem? Uh, well, what, what is the truth? Already in uniformity three, it's not clear if it's into the eight over three or into the 11 over four, but lots of graphs. It's very interesting, I think, to wonder what happened with the primal number of um, the complete data type graph where the two sides have the same size. Uh, the same size. So. Uh, when, uh, when k equals two and three, we saw this is somewhat well understood with the art instructions uh, matching the covariance to unbound. But in general, um, we don't know much more than the probabilistic deletion construction, which, which uh, has that many edges. So uh, I think it's a nice question. Uh, can, can one perhaps uh, gain a polynomial factor in N? Over the probabilistic deletion bound, among other things, this would imply also an optimal counting result for the number of uh, graphs on envelopes that are free of the complete bipartite graph with k on the left, k on the right from this hypergraph container story. 
So some things are known better than the deletion, but somehow accidental uh, results. So somehow this, uh, these norm graph constructions from the asymmetric problem serve as constructions that uh, are also free of uh, K33, K44, K66 of the corresponding uh, sizes here. So uh, there are constructions that be this by a polynomial factor. In this case, this problem is solved, but then for um, at least seven, the, the best bound comes from so-called this uh, graph removal process, K, uh, KTT removal process uh, by Bowman and Kivaj that gains the power of log over, over the deletion bound, but not, not the power. So it doesn't even imply the count of the result. Thank you. This is uh, the problem. I live here. Sorry for going a bit over time. Well, so, did you say that uh, you all can always take R into the one to get the best bound in the Yes, yes. So, I, uh, I I was planning on maybe uh, saying some things about that when it came up, but uh, uh, I think I, I forgot. Uh, yes, indeed. So, which. Uh, um, so for our construction to work, one just needs to consider one single tensor uniformly random. But this is a priori not clear at all. Once once one sets up uh, this this construction, it's somewhat uh, uh, arithmetic algebraic curiosity, just how the numbers uh, work out. Uh, as, as I was saying in the Gunders and Rodel Sidorenko construction, it's uh, really not the case at all that uh, that choosing random hyperplanes works so somehow. Uh, uh, here, uh, choosing random hyperplanes does, does the job in all uniformities better than higher codimension subspaces. <clears throat> if you want to exclude K3, can you use similar ideas to replace hyperplanes with surfaces? Yes, yes. So that's a very good, good question. I tried. Uh, we tried for a bit. Uh, uh, it, it's very natural question. Um, I, I think the short answer is that it doesn't really work <laughs> if one needs one needs some ideas. It, a, 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 a highly non-trivial enemy here is that, uh, well, when we have two vertices per blob, if one is not the scalar uh, multiple of another, then they're linearly independent. This is not really true if you have three per blob. So indeed, one needs to maybe define some other things. Uh, and it's tempting to try with quadratic uh, Surfaces, but we don't really find uh, a way to do it. Another obstruction, if for this for a concrete obstruction for that idea, is, the, is that we don't really know how to extract uh, large subsets and FQ to the S without tricollinear. So, uh, a nice, uh, a, a, a good thing to try would be to, you know, restrict instead of having a V equal the full as dimensional vector space, you would maybe like to pass to a large subset. That has nice behavior so that you can really compute these statistics very nicely. In particular, it does not have three collinear, would uh, be great. And that's a property to look for in, in quadratic surfaces. Uh, the best bounds, so that, that is what really makes quadratic surfaces an interesting object for, for this approach, but uh, that doesn't really work. Somehow, the best bounds, the best constructions are not really.